hit the ground running with the most revolutionary personal training program ever developed. The National Academy of Sports Medicine, the number one choice for fitness professionals, makes it quick, easy, and affordable to learn on the go. Be your own boss and start transforming lives from 9 to 99 with the all-new certified personal training program only at NASM.org. You're listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie. It's great to have everybody here with us today. I want to let you know how much I appreciate it and how much I'm looking forward to a conversation we're going to have today. Today, we have a gentleman named Dan McKeska on the show. We're going to talk a little bit about population health. And what we mean by that is that populations, and I'm, I'm assuming that you're probably pretty familiar with this, that the American population in particular we have a lot of chronic disease. And I read something yesterday, just going through some research and writing some papers, I read something yesterday that a half, one half of Americans have a chronic disease. Uh, I have one. My, like there are a lot of people that are in good fitness that have health pathologies. And there are a lot of people out there that have some really difficult times with their health and their overall wellness. And we know, we are quite familiar with the benefits that come with movement and how movement helps to maintain, helps to actually benefit when it comes to many, many of these pathologies. And so one of the reasons that I'd, I'm happy that we've got Dan on the show today is because he's a clinical exercise specialist and he's written this incredible curriculum for, for medical exercise. And we're just gonna kind of pick his brain about what's going on, but he's also a businessman. So we're gonna, we're gonna get into all of that. So Dan, it's great to have you on the show. Happy you're here, man. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. For sure. So tell everybody a little bit about you, your education, experience, business, wow. background, all that stuff. Oh, wow. Um, so I started a, I started in fitness just over 25 years ago. I uh, opened up my own little training studio. And I also, I actually started out in martial arts and my goal was to be, my goal was to become a martial arts instructor, um, which I did and I, I still dabble in. But um, what I soon discovered was that the demographic I was getting in were 40 to 60 year olds and 65 year olds and people everybody had a chronic disease of some sort or they just or they had been sedentary for too long yeah. um, so fitness kind of took over my business um and and what started out being mostly martial arts over like a four or five year period slowly transformed into much much more fitness um and then i started networking with doctors and chiropractors and massage therapists and physical therapists and soon realized that this is a population that needs help. Um, and honestly, as, as a business standpoint, the demographic is much larger than the martial arts demographic, which is 18 to 34 year old males versus the 40 to 65 or 75 year old uh, uh, male or female who, who have been sitting for too long, basically. Uh, so I, my, my business slowly transformed in over a number of years. I realized also I didn't have a great education. Um, so I went back to school, finished my undergrad. Then I figured I might as well just keep going. So I got my master's. Um, and then I finally ended up just getting my doctorate as well um, in health science. Nice. While you were at it, just while you were at it, going from master's, nah, let's, let's go ahead and throw the doctorate in there too, huh? You know what? I might as well. Um, <laughs> It's actually kind of funny. I looked at my wife one day when, before I started all this. I'm like, oh, what do you think about me going back to school and finishing my undergrad? And she's, oh, that's a great idea. I think you should. And, and 12 years later, I ended up with my doctorate. Um, <laughs> and then so, but the, the, the health science program I was in wasn't specifically geared toward just fitness people. It was people from all different areas of health. And that, so we had a lot of PAs. We had some nurses. We had some uh, health informatics people. So, so there was a lot of people in the program, 
who weren't in fitness. In fact, there was only one or two of us at the time that I remember that were actually doing fitness stuff. But networking with these people and talking to these people, everybody kept coming back to the same thing. We have a population that has chronic disease. Uh, I, I believe you mentioned at the beginning of the show that 50% or more of our population, 50 to 60% has at least one chronic disease. 25% yeah. of people age un, under the age of 70 have, have two or more and 75% over the people, uh, over people age 75, I think have two or more. So this isn't a small problem and fitness and exercise and activity in general is the primary way of dealing with a lot of this. It's primary prevention. It's the front line of healthcare in our world today, and it should be, um, but nobody's addressing that. Um, you mentioned population health at the beginning. Everybody's ignoring this issue. Um, so that's what my doctoral dissertation was on, was a lack of education for dealing with chronic disease via exercise. Uh, and it's just, it, 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 it's out there in bits and spurts, but there's no really great program out there. Um, and, and obviously it's becoming more and more prevalent now. I think, I think COVID has really um, spotlighted the issue in that we can't really afford to have chronic diseases anymore. Um, it, it's costing us, uh, it, it's costing our lives, it's costing our productivity, it's costing, our, it's, it's costing people's lifestyles and quality of life. So, you know, the idea behind the, the clinical exercise program is to start addressing that in primary prevention, uh, where you can stop something before it starts, or even secondary prevention, where you can stop or reverse the progression of something, of a chronic disease. And I've, I've got so much that I want to unpack right here. So let me just start with this one. I think the biggest thing with a lot of trainers, especially younger trainers, is they want to work with athletes, right? Like they want to, to train somebody bigger, faster, stronger. And that's a cool gig. That's a cool gig. And I know I've been in that gig, maybe not as fulfilling and certainly not as much business out there for working with athletes as there is working with people that have chronic conditions. What should the fitness industry, what should personal trainers in general start thinking about when it comes to working with these populations? So I actually, as I mentioned, I started out in martial arts and when I first started doing more fitness stuff, it was to start training. Uh, this was at a time where MMA was getting huge. And, and, yeah. You know, and, and, and so I wanted to train MMA athletes and, and I had a handful that I did work with and, and they were great, but the population, the demographics of our country, the, the chronic disease demographic is greater than the athlete demographic. Um, so everybody, when they're getting their undergrad or, or they're getting their first certification, everybody wants to train athletes, as you mentioned. Um, and, and as you said, it is a great gig, but let's say you do train an athlete. Okay, let's, let's say you build a business and you're training athletes. So you have four years of high school athletes. They go off to college. Um, they've got trainers at college. They might come home. So you might see them over Christmas or, or whatever the holiday break is called. Um, and you might see them over summer break, but then they go back to college. So, so you really have four years to deal with someone. I had some of my clients for 10 and 15 years. I, I, I still keep in touch with clients I had 20 years ago. Um, and we still talk about what we did and, and, and what's changed and how I can still help them. So the, the demographic is just greater. From a business standpoint, it made so much more sense to me to go to the demographic of somebody with chronic disease than it did to stick with athletes. Um, yeah. The other point of view is with athletes, most of them are younger. And as they get to start their lives. They, they get a job, you know, they have, they have to go into a job every day, um, assuming they don't become a pro athlete, in which case, if they do become a pro athlete, they've got trainers on their team, so they won't need you anymore. Um, they've got, um, they, they, maybe they're starting a family, uh, you know, they, they're, they're just starting out in life. And unless they get paid to be an athlete, you're not a priority anymore. Um, whereas somebody who's been sitting behind a desk for 20 years and all of a sudden stands up one day and their low back hurts or their knee hurts, or they go to their doctor and they're pre-diabetic or they're pre-hypertensive, you know, or maybe they, maybe they put on 15 you know, pounds over the past 10 years or whatever, they're going to come to you and they're going to stay with you, particularly if you start getting them results. And, and if you talk to their doctors, which is hugely important today. Um, and so one thing this program does is it uses verbiage 
that doctors are going to use. You can actually now intelligently talk to a doctor in their language, a physician or a clinician, a physical therapist or a chiropractor or whoever, in their language. So, you know, now you're starting to up your game a little bit. Yeah, without a doubt. I also know that a lot of times people get into personal training later on they oftentimes will say, I got into this gig because I want to help people. But early on, they may say that, but they may not feel that because they want to work with athletes. They may want to help athletes get bigger, faster, stronger. But then the, the wheels start spinning that, how can I really help people? And athletes can really use some help. But like you said, at a certain level, those athletes are being helped by the teams and the organizations that they work with. And personal trainers, general personal trainers, will not have access to those type of people. We have access to people with chronic disease daily. We have access to people who need our help and our support with our ability to effectively and efficiently support them in their process. So that's why I think this is such a valuable, valuable conversation and one that needs to be had and that we can start directing people and their ideas, their concepts of who and what a personal trainer is. Because sometimes we still look at personal training in the industry and people look at us in the industry and they say, you help people build muscle, you work people really hard, you get their heart rate up, they sweat a lot. I heard this word burpees a lot. I don't know what that is, but I heard that you do it and that they're awful. But who are we and what do we really do? And I think that that we put ourselves in a box, but we also need to make sure that we're flourishing a little bit more and blossoming and letting people know that it's more than just making people sweat, more than just making people ache and have doms for a couple of days, that there are outcomes beyond just, are you are you bigger, faster, or stronger? So, so I also think something that, that I, should have touched on a bit earlier also is as trainers, we don't have to choose. Why can't we do both? Why can't we train those student athletes? But they're going to, who's dropping those student athletes off? Their parents. So why don't, why don't we work with their parents, with their parents as well? Um, the, the studio I had um, uh, had a huge martial arts area. And so that martial arts area was also rented out to a number of other martial arts programs. And the parents would come in and they would drop their kids off at the martial arts program. And then they would look over at what we're what, what on the fitness end we were doing. Mm-hmm. And they would want to come in and, and work with us while their kids were working out doing the martial arts. So we don't have to pick and choose which clients we train. Um, you know, we, we can do both. We can train athletes and we can train um, people with chronic disease. You know, it, it's just a matter of can we progress or regress the exercises and, and how do we understand what the intensity is? Um, for, for the people right. that can't keep up to that intensity that, that, that a student athlete would do or a pro athlete would do. I think that's awesome. I also want to point out that you and I have a lot in common. And th- it really started out for me in martial arts. The first job, when I, when I dreamed of what I was going to be when I grew up, my first thing was I was going to own a martial arts studio that had a gym connected with it. And so there would be a gym and then there would be a little studio space that that I could teach people martial arts. And uh, th- there became a, a, a shift. I would less focus on martial arts, more focus on fitness. And you know, a few decades later, I've got several personal training gyms in New York City, and it's been an absolute blessing. So for me, I knew I wanted to do that. I also felt like I could know more. Right, I wanted to be educated. So at first I kind of went down the list of what are the biggest, best certifications out there. And then I said, I, I can probably I could probably up my game a little bit. And I went back and got my master's and then went back and got my doctorate. So very, very similar to you. It's been a great ride. It's been an absolute great ride. And my my mind has shifted very much to what I was talking about what you and I were talking about, which is I do want to help people. I want to martial arts and basketball players and, the, and I've worked with them like you, I've worked with them, but that's, that's no longer the deep end of the pool for me. That's a very, very shallow end where I don't have a lot of people like that. I have a lot of people that could use a lot of help in many, many different ways on a lot of the topics that we're discussing. Oh, yeah. so, 
what are some of the big things that you see? One of the, uh, I also talked about early on when we were discussing highlights of what we want to discuss. One was, what are these studies that people find out, oh, you are, you're, 25% more likely, these correlation studies, these epidemiological studies, what, what do they mean? How do they get this information that says, if this, then you are likely to be 25, 28% more likely to have heart disease or diabetes? Um, what does that mean? And then well, population um, we're experiencing what are some of the biggest things out there, the biggest pathological populations that you see that fitness specifically can help support? So this, the way a study is actually performed is, is, is for the best studies out there, there's a control group and then there's the intervention group. So um, knowing that the, and, 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 so we have all these stats on what the average lifespan in the U.S. is, which I think is now 79 years old or something. Um, and if you start smoking at a certain age, your lifespan is known to be cut short by this much based on the statistics we have. Um, you know, if, if you're this many pounds overweight, you're more likely to develop diabetes. And these are all based on the statistics we have, which is where those 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 percentages come from. Um, yeah. The honestly, the biggest, the, the, the largest uh, chronic disease we have in the U.S. is cardiovascular disease um, and hypertension is number one. High blood pressure is number one with that. Um, and what's so scary about high blood pressure is somebody could look to be in great shape and they can still have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that goes back to, you know, there, there, there are the, the smoking, excessive alcohol, sedentary lifestyle. Um, and poor nutrition were four biggest things that create the chronic diseases we have. Um, so getting, eliminating some of those things, um, that's, that's where we know that we can make a difference. And so getting the activity can decrease hypertension. It's, it's proven. Uh, there are studies out there that say all this, and, and I have all those studies cited in the book that I wrote and the textbook that goes along with this program. Um, and these are some of the things that you're going to learn. So, um, with with all of that going on um we also have obesity which uh, i think the latest numbers for obesity are i forget what the number is but close to 40 percent um have obese of the population has obesity today so again we have all these things that we know we can help and and the, the biggest part of it is we have to get people up and moving and we also have to know that we can make a difference and we have to know how to get them up and moving. So if somebody comes in, you know, if somebody has come in and they've had a heart attack and then they want to train with you, well, you need to talk to their cardiologist. You need to find out how far through cardiac rehab they got. Um, and that's what this program goes into a little bit of is, is just, just to, how do we deal with people with chronic diseases in that respect? Are, in this program, do you also review or go over graded exercise testing that that maybe personal trainers can employ? So one of the, I, I, I or no, you don't have to, right? <laughs> no, I'm not. So one of the things that I did when I was looking at the other programs out there. So uh, there are a few other programs out there that that have similar information that this does. And some of them actually go into a lot more depth and detail than this does. What I found about some of these other programs was that I couldn't use a lot of the stuff they were talking about. Yeah. I, in a personal training studio, I don't have access to 10, 12, $20,000 VO2 max testing equipment. I, I just don't. Um, I, yeah, I can take body fat percentages. Okay. Anybody can do that, but that's, but that's not what I'm talking about. And so when you're talking about the, the, the progressive, the, the exercise testing, um, we need to work more with the RPE, the, the rating of perceived exertion. We need to work. Yeah. With nice. Well how, said. How, how do they how, That's what we have access to. And, and, you know, there are studies out there that actually correlate those to the lactate threshold. So you can actually do an aerobic assessment on someone, aerobic capacity assessment on someone without having all this expensive equipment. Now, is it 100% totally perfectly accurate? No, it's not. But at least it's a baseline that we can work from. And 
you're not dealing with a client who is at high risk from having a heart attack while they're exercising. This client is past that. Okay, you've talked to their doctors, you've talked to their physical therapists, you've talked to their cardiac rehab people, so you know where this client came from, you know what this client is capable of doing. It's not like somebody walks in and they say, hey, I just had a heart attack four days ago, can you help me exercise? And you're going to raise your hand and say, yeah, yeah, I'll take you as a client. No, you have to talk to their doctor. This, this is one reason why so many trainers have horrible in the training industry in general. And it's getting better now, but for, for a decade we've had a horrible reputation with physicians. Because we go in and we start dealing with things that we know nothing about. Well, let's start learning about those things. Let's not be ignorant in our profession. Let's become students of our own profession. Let's learn what we can to help the people in front of us. Well said. Well said. Again. Yeah. Oh, Sorry oh. about my diatribe there. No, no, <laughs> no, no. I love no, no. <laughs> Uh, uh, I also I like that the new CPT seven. Yeah. It's um, we really focus on rate of perceived exertion. Okay. We do the RPE, and we it seems like we almost exclusively shift towards that. And you know, if I could have a little, if there were little sound boards that I could have, it would be like cha ching right now for the the shout out for CPT seven. But it's something that RPE, rate of perceived exertion. How do you feel while you're exercising? One of the problems is that it's subjective, but in objective assessments, and I've gone through some, some clinical exercise uh, training, and at no point am I going to be working with a client and take their exercise blood pressure. Like that's just not who I work with. That's not the population I work with. Uh, and so there, there are some challenges that are there, and that's that works really well for exercise physiologists who are doing cardio rehab, but that's not what I plan on doing. That's not what the majority of personal trainers by far would ever expect. So some of these clinical tests can be a little bit challenging. There are some great assessments that are out there that many people can employ. It could be, you know, a step test or a treadmill test, a walking test, uh, you know, all sorts of wonderful things. And, and I do go over uh, the step test, the rock court walk test. So there's a number of tests okay. and assessments that I do discuss uh, in the program. Um, and, and you have to. Unless you're attached to a university or a hospital, you generally will not have access to expensive assessment equipment. So you have to do what you can. Um, for our movement screen, we start with a posture and the overhead squat assessment. Um, there, there are two proven assessments for movement and, and movement dysfunction. And that's where we have to start. Um, we also have to know what our scope of practice is. And, and this is something that I'm really particular about. Um, you know, we, we don't ever touch a client and we don't diagnose pain. Our, our, our expertise is in diagnosing movement and that's what we should be looking at. We, we don't have the equipment to diagnose pain. Um, you know, okay. somebody says, oh, my shoulder hurts. Oh, it's probably impingement. Well, okay, that's a guess. And if you work on that and it's actually a torn rotator cuff, you're going to mess up your client. So why would you do that? Um, so, so we need to know where our, where our scope of practice ends. We're part of a healthcare team. We are not the healthcare team. We're not physicians. Well, it's actually some of us might be. I, I'm not a physician. I have my doctorate in health science, but I'm not a physician. Um, I don't do MRIs, I don't do x-rays, I don't do any of that stuff. So I have to go to the people that do do those. Um, I, have to, I have to have a network of people. I am not an expert in nutrition. I can talk about m macros and, and some micronutrients, um, but I'm not a registered dietitian. So I have to know that that's outside of my scope of practice. If somebody comes in and says, wow, with high blood pressure, wow, what should I be eating? Well, maybe she will meet your salt content, but go talk to a registered dietitian. I, that's outside of what I do. Right. Yeah. You don't want to be like, well, my dad had it and this is what he did. Or, you know, you, we, got, we can't do that because these kind of in of one moments, you know, taking one example and applying it to everybody, especially po uh, people that have pathologies like that puts us in a very bad place. That's not our purpose. Same thing with what you said about movement. I think that's really, really well said. We are the people we can diagnose movement but we don't diagnose pain. And the CES second edition that came out just recently, it does a wonderful job focusing on that and talking about it and discussing it. 
because we are looking at people's movement. And if we address their movement, we may in fact help to mitigate their pain, but diagnosing the pain, saying this is why you hurt, is not the right place for us to be, and we should certainly refer out. And, and that's, I, I, I go through a lot of that within this program is scope of practice. Um, on everything, almost every chapter, the end part says, we can't diagnose pain, um, you know, we, and we can't, di we can't prescribe diets. That's not what we do. Um, if you're a registered dietitian and a trainer and you're doing this, okay, great. You know, you should be able to prescribe your diet. Um, but if you're not, then maybe you should stay within your lane. Yeah, uh, well said. I, I think, again, but it's also that type of thing where fitness over the past couple of decades has really gotten a bad reputation because you do have trainers prescribing diets and you do have trainers diagnosing pain and looking at, at, at things other than what we should be doing. Um, you do have uh, trainers touching their clients, um, you know, maybe maybe pushing on pressure points and things of that nature. Well, mm -hmm. again, that's OK. I, I, I'm not going to I'm not necessarily criticizing that if you're right. But what if you're pushing on a pressure point and the person has a torn tendon or a shredded tendon and you're pushing on a tight muscle and that's just making it worse? We don't know because we're not physicians and we don't have the diagnostic equipment to, to determine that. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I wanna make sure that we all understand where we stand within, it, it's a healthcare team. We are not the healthcare team, we are part of it. And, and that rest of it could be a dietitian or a mind-body specialist like yoga or meditation or, you know, right. uh, uh, well, regardless of whatever it is, the physician and, and the referring physician, if you start networking with physicians, whether it's an oncologist or, or uh, a metabolic person or, or you know, renal, whatever, they're the center of our, our team. We need, to, we need to abide by what they tell us and recommend. Perfectly said. Again, we are talking with Dan McKeska, and he is the author of Clinical Exercise Specialist Manual. It's a fitness professional's guide to exercise and chronic disease. And he's written a course. He's a clinical exercise specialist who focuses on these things. And there, are, I've, I've looked at the overview of your manual and your work and your content, the course, and it's really stellar. Like it, it's really some, some good work. Before we get into talking a little bit more about some of the things that you talk in your book, I want to bring something up as a parent. And what I want to bring up is, I think, important for a lot of people, but it's always kind of lifted up and brushed under the rug. We see chronic disease. Chronic disease is, is uh, elevating and escalating. It's more and more. We've got a lot of people at younger and younger ages with chronic diseases. We know that movement, movement, not even just exercise, but movement, like just non-sedentary behaviors are highly supportive of better health and wellness outcomes. What is your opinion? What is your thought? What is your perception of exercise and its place in our schools and how exercise in younger populations could help support us with some of the issues we're seeing today? So on a personal note, um, I'm one of those guys who, if Ridlin was around when I was a kid, I would have been put on it. I was the most hyperactive, inattentive student possible, um, which is probably, I mean, which is why I didn't finish my doctorate until decades later in life. Just right. Just had the attention to to do it. Um, and, and like me, all of your classmates from when you were younger are like, wait, that guy? <laughs> <laughs> that guy went back to school and got a doctor. <laughs> That's actually, I get that a lot. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of humorous talking to some people from, you know, then. Um, but we know, in, in fact, it's actually, I believe, a United Nations healthcare initiative, and they've actually determined it to be a human right that children have free play quite a few times during the day. Um, so children need to get out and play. And, and, and when they play, I mean, we all probably remember when we, we had recess as a kid, we'd go out, we'd, you know, either throw the ball at each other or, or run around or play on the jungle gyms or whatever, whatever, we, whatever equipment our schools had at the time. Um, that brings kids back into focus when they go back into the classroom. Um, and I think if you talk to almost every elementary school teacher out there, they'll, they'll agree with that. 
um, but we're foregoing that, um, and, and it's an unfortunate thing. We also know that kids develop bone strength. The, mature, the, the most bone growth is done during adolescence, and to take activity away from kids during that time will actually cause harm to them later on in life, uh, decades later in life, because they won't have the same bone density starting as they could have. Uh, if they had built that up during adolescence. So, so again, we, we know what all the benefits of activity are. Probably everybody listening to or watching this know what all the benefits are, but again, we're ignoring it. Um, right. you know, and, and it's a shame that we're doing that. We're, we're, we're foregoing PE and recess and, and for, for math and science, which is good, but why can't we do both? Um, we have to have PE and recess. Kids are much more attentive, <laughs> attentive when they come back from those activities. I know I was. Yeah, me, me too. In fact, with my kids, so they're, they're still going to school from home a lot of the day. So if they're going to school from home most of the day, uh, much to my wife's chagrin, I will actually tell them to clear off the table that's in the living room and climb on it and jump off. Climb on it and jump off because I may not have the time to, to work with them and play with them or go throw ball or chase them around or wrestle but they're gonna love that, and they do. And I want those body impacts. I want them climbing on the table and jumping off and hitting the floor. I wanna hear thuds, I want their little bodies to be knocked around, and I want those bones to start to get strengthened because I know that them sitting down all day long, they do it in school, but now I see it because I'm at home and I see right. them sitting in front of those screens and uh, screens are no screens. They're still sitting. They are sedentary children. And that is so um, contraindicated. It is so adverse to who we are as a species. And yet we're evolving socially to do things that our physiological evolution is not supportive of. Well, yeah, you know, there, there was a few, a few, maybe a 10, 12, 15 year period where doctors were telling parents not to let their kids jump and, 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 you know, oh, you shouldn't let them lift weights because it's bad for you or do all this other stuff. And the reality is every time a kid climbs a tree, they're lifting a weight, they're doing a pull up or a push up or, or a shimmy or something, you know, every time a kid jumps from a, from a rock onto the ground or from a, a, a mountain of dirt into whatever, or they dive into a pile of leaves, they're lifting weights for the most part. And, and that's what kids have done for millennia. Why, why rethink that? I, I, that's something that, that's totally flabbergasted me. In, in yeah. the it's just, and it's detrimental to society, you know, without teaching our kids that, first off, it's fun. No, right. It's, I, I mean, that's, that's make it fun, you know? and, and so I was in a I was in a seminar years ago. Actually, it was it was for my master's program, and one of the professors gets up there and he's giving this lecture. and And the first question he asks is, "What is the best form of exercise and activity?" And all these people are raising their hands. Oh, squats are great. Push ups are great. You know. Oh, I love you know box dumps, whatever. And I'm I'm the guy who always sits in the back of the room because I want to be by the door because of that eight that that hyperactivity thing. I hate sitting. <laughs> Um, so I'll get up and sneak out, but I'm, so I'm sitting there right by the door and I raise my hand and, and I said, you know, the best activity is the one you're going to do. And half the class turned around and laughed and the guy's like, well, he's actually right. So 100%. You have 100%. to do enjoy. And when we quit doing that, when we quit enjoying the exercise of what we're doing, and don't get me wrong, if you're, if you're, if you're going out and you're lifting weights and you want to get stronger, Okay, you might say you enjoy it, but if you're really enjoying it too much, you're probably doing something wrong because it should be miserable for you <laughs> by the time <laughs> you're doing something like that. But but if you go play a pickup game of basketball somewhere, you join yeah. a gym that has, you know, you know, pickleball today is huge. Right. Um, I, I, I've never played, but I know so many people that love pickleball. You walk into a gym today and they're playing pickleball. And, and it's huge. Uh, it's a few people Googling pickleball right now. Oh, people wow. are Googling it right now. Google's going to have a spike for that search. Yeah. <laughs> but, but seriously, so, 
but go out and enjoy. I don't care if it's bowling. Go out and do something, you know? Go out and do what you enjoy. It's any activity you're going to enjoy. And it's the same thing for children. We have to get them involved with something they're going to enjoy. Um, whether it's, maybe a kid loves soccer, so put them in soccer. Maybe they don't. Maybe a kid just wants to go out in the backyard and rage out for 20 minutes. Let them go do that, you know? Something. That, so right. I mean, that's my take with children today. Um, we, we, need, we need to get them outside and moving. It's, it's really that simple. And, and it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. We don't have to have a prescription for exercise for children. There is one. It's, it's go move, go do go something. Play. Go, go play. play. And, yeah. and here's the thing. Um, this is where it bothers me is that for me, it's not so much are we setting up our children to be the most fit, right? Like, are we doing this for the fitness of our children? Yes, that's important. But more important, I think, is that we are setting up behaviors that people will do for a prolonged period of time or a lifetime that we are teaching them now. I mean, if we're looking at this and saying, hey, that's why we're teaching you stuff in school so that you can take that information and apply it over a lifetime, then I would dare to say, and it's not that daring to do so, that movement, regular exercise, activity, your fitness levels, your ability to move and play and have fun and function, and then also put together maybe some graded or not graded, but like doing some exercise test where I know, you know, I, I ran the mile of Friday when I was in, in middle school, it was, uh, it was when we ran the mile and we ran the mile. That's what we did on Fridays. We knew we we're going to do it. And after whatever, seven, eight, 10, 12 minutes, 15 minutes for some, th then we could do whatever we wanted to but we were running the mile and that was what was gonna happen that day. I was working out uh, up the other day and my youngest son came down to work out with me and I was just doing band stuff and it was 60 seconds on, 60 seconds off. And you know, after a few sets of you know, explosively pushing those bands out, set after set after set, I was groaning and moaning and my little guy was like, dad, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Stop talking. Uh, <laughs> but it it's not fun, but it gives me pride. I am oh. proud of myself for what I've done. And not everybody's there. Not everybody's in a place where they can push themselves to the point of real discomfort, potentially even pain, not injur injurious pain, but you know what I mean. Sure. Not everybody's there, but people need to start somewhere. And we as personal trainers need to understand that we need to start with our clients where they are, not where we are. So one of the things I just actually discuss in, in the program and in the textbook is we, when we get a client, we have to first determine how functional they are because without being functional, they, they can't get anywhere. Uh, after they're functional, can they be healthy? Because without being healthy, they'll never get fit. And yeah. then, so our next role is to get them fit. And then on to performance, if that's something they want to do. But without being functional, you can't be healthy. Without being healthy, you can't be fit. Without being fit, you can't, you can't have a high level of performance. So we have to understand that all of those pieces come into play. Um, children, when you watch children play and move, they are functional. And, and so what, what, I, what I mean by functional is that there's, that there's five movements that determine functionality. Um, and, and all of these movements or a combination of these movements aren't everything we do. And it's, it's squatting, pushing, pulling, twisting, and single leg movements, like such as lunges or walking or something along those lines. And if we can make sure that the people we're dealing with have those pieces, then we can start moving them to get healthy and then fit. Uh, as you were mentioning about children, children have those. You watch a child play, they can squat, they can push, they can pull, they do this all day long when they're playing. That's that's the issue that, that we're starting to come across now is we've had children that haven't had the luxury of free play and to do things of that nature. Um, you know, and, and then there's a whole debate, I'm not gonna get into it, uh, whether kids should specialize or not. Oh, well, my kid plays right. soccer, oh, my kid plays basketball, oh, my kid plays baseball. Is, is, is a kid specializing in one thing really important for the kid. I mean, in, in certain ways, it teaches them discipline and it teaches them teamwork and it teaches them all the important things, attributes that those sports will teach. 
Um, but functionally speaking, is that the best way to go? And and, and I don't know. Um, <laughs> if you ask any pro athlete during the uh, during the on season, they're probably doing corrective exercises to mitigate the repetitive movements they're doing during the off uh, during the on season. And during the off season, they're doing everything else. Right. Right. Uh, so, so again, you know, when we get our kids into these 12 month sports and, you know, they've got a spring league and a summer league and a fall league and a winter league, is, is that the right way to go? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I still think free play is the best way to go because that's what's going to teach the kids all the functionality of what they need to move forward in life so they can be healthy adults. And, and as you mentioned, you know, when you're down there doing it with your kids, what a great example you're setting. But a lot of parents can't. Um, you know, a lot of the people that, 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 that unfortunately are my age, they can't move that way anymore. They can't do push-ups. I mean, you know, I, I can drop into a few push-ups here and there and, and people are amazed at, wow, you do those really well. And it's like, well, because I never stopped, you know, right, right. So that's just one of the things that, that we have to just keep moving. And if you're not moving now, we have to get started. And as a trainer, as, as somebody dealing with that demographic, we need to understand that they have to be functional first. And, and I'm not talking about the buzzword of functional fitness. I'm not talking about, you know, and now again, it's a debate. I'm not going to get into whether kettlebell swings are a functional activity or not. The components might be because you're pushing and you're doing a squat or a dead and, and, and you're lifting something, but break those components down. Can your client squat to a reasonable extent? Can they touch the floor when they squat without actually bending over? Um, can they do single leg movements? What's the balance progression we need to do so that we can ensure they can do single leg movements when they need to? Um, you know, can, can they twist? Does their back hurt every time they try to reach for something or does their shoulder hurt? So, so again, these are the things we have to ensure that as, as trainers, we're starting, we're looking at these things first and not just saying, okay, do these step ups. Well, if a client, right. can't, do a, like, if a client can't balance for a minute, they can't do a step up. So oh, well we're said. getting those things done. Right. All right. So again, ladies and gentlemen, today we've got Dan McKeska on the show and he has developed a exercise curriculum, a, a clinical exercise specialist curriculum. And I want to discuss with you, Dan, a little bit more about this curriculum. Congratulations, by the way, for putting this together, the book. Uh, it's available on Amazon if you want to get the, the, the book that you have. But tell us a little bit more now specifically about the coursework. It has been approved for NASM CEUs 1.9. Uh, so for those of you that are NASM certified, if something like this seems like it's what you want to do for your recertification, then the only other thing, the only other requirement you'd really need to do is to get your CPR AED renewed and then you would be completely done for your recertification, except for the actual process of going through and, and logging and reapplying for that, that continuing education, the recertification. But with that said, Dan, tell us a little bit more about the book, the program. Uh, you know, we've got a good idea of so why. I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll, let me go a little bit into the, the history of this. All I right. didn't set out to do any of this. Um, I, I had a, my own training studio. I've, I've since moved uh, into a different part of the country, but right outside of Washington, D.C. in Northern Virginia, I had my own training studio. And I primarily was working with clients with some sort of chronic disease, whether it's orthopedic or I, I had a few clients that had cancer, um, you know, metabolic diseases, things of that nature, diabetes. Anyway, so I started getting too busy. And every trainer out there is thinking, wow, what a great problem to have. Right. Yeah. Good That's for fun. you. <laughs> well, trainers who work a lot realize how quickly you can burn out. Mm -hmm. if you're in the fitness business and you're dealing with a client in front of you, you can't afford to have a bad day. You have to be on all the time. It, you know, I, I can't hide behind a computer screen when I'm standing in front of a client and I have to give them the best workout they've ever had, or at least let them think it's the best workout they've ever had when they leave. So they leave feeling good every time. Um, and, and you burn out really quickly. So I started looking, I, I couldn't find any trainers who could do what I did. And so I, I'm like, all right, so maybe I'll develop. I had a couple of trainers who were running space from me and, uh, and I was working pretty well with them. So I said, you know, maybe I'll develop a little training guide for them. So I started putting something together and 
I'm like, you know, all of a sudden what started out as a, you know, 20 page training guide turned into a 240 page book and then Jeez. into, then into a 1.9, uh, continuing ed pro, uh, 1.9, uh, credit continuing ed program. And so what I did is I, I, I looked through all of the other programs out there and I won't name them all because there's quite a few of them. And what I thought about was what do I like about these programs and what do I not like about these programs? What I did, what I liked about them was the content they had was really good and it was really in depth and they, they covered a lot of stuff. What I did not like about some, a lot, actually most of them was they did not specifically address the trainer in a studio or a gym. And that's where that, that's where we, that's where I think a lot of these certifications aren't living up to what they should be doing. Um, we need to be able to address trainers where they are. We talk about that with our clients, but why can't we do that with the fitness professionals as well? They're in a, tra they're in a training studio. Maybe they just opened, maybe they're working on their own and all they have is a bunch of bands some dumbbells and a cup and a bench and some free weights and maybe a lap pull down or something. So we need to, we need to address those trainers because honestly, those are the majority of the trainers that I've known over the past 25, 30 years of doing this. I, I do know some trainers that work for athletic teams and, and have all the great equipment in universities or they work in a hospital and they have all this great equipment, but that's not the majority of the people that I know. So I wanted to write a, uh, I, I wanted this program to be for them. So I developed this program because I needed people to know what I knew. Um, and so I took the best of, I, I left out what I didn't like about the other programs and I took the best of what I did like and I put them into this training program. And then I broke it down into a number of different areas. And the first area is, is scope of practice. If we want to understand why other clinical areas and healthcare professionals don't like most trainers, it's because we go outside our scope of practice. We have to make sure that we stay within our lane. Um, then I go over assessment and, and it's cardio capacity and posture and movement. And then I discuss fit protocols and, and the generals of those. Um, then I get into cardiopulmonary disease, metabolic disease. Um, I get into um, uh, orthopedic dysfunction and then a couple other things, uh, uh, aging and overuse. So arthritis and low back pain and things of that nature. Um, and so this book is broken down into, it's, it's 25 chapters plus an introduction. So there's 26 modules to this program. Um, and each module addresses a specific need. Now, with that said, most of these chapters in the book, most of them are, are you know, five to 10 pages uh, because I wanted to make this concise. So if you, if, you, if you get the hard, I like having a hardback, which is why I developed the hardback. Um, I like writing and underlining and taking notes in the margins and things like that. And I guess I'm just old school that way. But also, I want something available on my phone. Because I, when I was training clients, I had all of their workouts on my phone, on spreadsheets on my phone. So if I all of a sudden get a client or I don't know something, I want to be able to access that manual. So the Kindle version is also available. So you can download this right on your phone. And the, and the, and the chapters are in easy. It, it gives a background of, of the disease, whatever the disease might be. Um, it goes into some into some, some statistics, contraindications, what you should be doing. Um, goes into fit protocols for for for, for whatever it is, um, and and then and you, it's everything's in lists and easy to read chapters or easy to use tables and, and chapters. So you can download this on your phone and you can you know you've got the information in front of you. Uh, and and so the program on and the LMSs that it's on right now. Um, learning management systems, it's broken down into chapters as well. So every chapter has a five to 10 question quiz that's optional. I recommend taking it because it will gauge your understanding of how well you've done and what you've taken away from that chapter, um, but you don't have to, to take it. it it's, it's, it's not, and there's no passing grade on the quizzes. And then depending on what LMS it is, it's, it's 100 to 125 question final exam, which is mandatory, there's no time limit. Um, so that, that's pretty much it. And, and I go, I discuss all of these conditions, all of these chronic diseases, 30 or so chronic diseases that we should understand, or at least have some familiarization with. And it's, and, and it's enough. So you can now go talk to that person's physical therapist. You can go talk to their oncologist or nephrologist or whatever it might be their, 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 uh, 
you know, metabolic doctor or, or whoever it is, you can go talk to them and talk to them and understand what they're telling you. Um, you know, and, and honestly, yeah, yeah. when you start doing that, the fitness, the reputation of the fitness industry starts lifting a lot. And we need to start positioning ourselves as the front line of healthcare today. We need to be the front great, line great. of preventive medicine and healthcare because we all, everybody listening to this right now knows that that's what activity is. That's what we do. Right. I agree 100%. I agree 100%. Uh, now while I've got you, are you hearing that echo? Is that just me? All right. It's gone. All right. So uh, one question that we have. So what we do is we ask questions sometimes to the audience and the audience who is listening to the NASM Facebook Live can can send in questions. So uh, our producer, Greg, is and uh, sorry, Eric is our uh, producer on today. He wants to know we've got um, Mayor Prudence. I don't know if I said that right, but um, would you speak to lactic acid overabundance and fibromyalgia along with the ratios of CO2 and O2? Thank you. Do you, is that within your course of study there, sir? It is not. Um, I looked into doing some chapters on fibromyalgia and the reality is that could be an entire program within itself. Um, there's so much information out there and right now there's a lot of it that's contraindicated um, or not contraindicated, contra contradictory to each other. So I actually didn't get into that. Um, I don't go into lactic acid abundance because again, that's, if, if that's an issue for one of your clients, then it's obviously a huge issue for in, in your situation, but it's not for what most trainers are going to have to go through. I, I understand yeah, that. I also, I remember of, studying. Again, I don't want to speak out on something I don't know or try to make something up as I go along because I'll just look more foolish. So, you know, I, I, I really, I, I just, I, I can't really speak to a lot of that. I understand that. And fibromyalgia, it, it's, a, it's a tricky one anyway. It's quite idiopathic. We don't, which means we just don't know why it happens. There's so many, uh, as you mentioned, the contradictory information about it. It's not well understood. And I, here's one thing I do know. I do that years ago, people, it's primarily women that get it. And physicians would tell people, uh, you're just a woman, right? And it's in your head. It's in your head. And I will say this, is, this right now it's, it's March 1st. Today's March 1st, uh, 2021 the day that we're recording this and we're live with it. So it's Women's History Month. So let's look back at some of the bad history that has happened and in, in medicine. And this fibromyalgia is one great example of men who just didn't get it. So they would say it's in your head. And there's so many things that end up happening like that. And fibromyalgia is really a, one, of those, one of those pathologies that we go, oh, I don't know what it is, so it must just be you. Right. We haven't learned a lot more about what's going on and the indications and uh, contraindications or the, the risk factors that are associated with certain things. And sometimes they're not indication or contraindications. Uh, sometimes they're simply just be aware of. But I saw this throughout my massage program as well as that sometimes massage was great for people with fibromyalgia and sometimes it was awful. Sometimes foam rolling was really helpful for people with fibromyalgia. Sometimes it was awful. So uh, I do appreciate that, you know, if we don't know what's going on, then we should not be speaking to it, uh, especially from from where we are in our perspective. I would, I would venture to say that exercise would be very indicated and highly supportive. But Again, like you said, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. So thank you so, for. And also as a heads up, so version two of this program, um, which I haven't actually started on yet, uh, I'm looking into doing more uh, some neurological diseases that, that might be out there, as well as some autoimmune diseases. So hopefully, maybe in, in, in the next version, I can cover something of that nature. But in this version, it's just not there. Perfect. All right. Uh, just real quick for um, for if are there any other questions that are out there? And if they're not, totally good. And 
I have um, a great appreciation for Dan, what you do, the the work that you've been putting in. And also I wanna point out, like you don't have to have a doctorate or a master's degree to put together content, develop programs, to, to write a book, to study. You don't have to go back to, to our formal um, traditional education. You are all, if you've done the NAS program or any other program, you've, you've put yourself in a position where you're going through selected learning. You are taking the responsibility on to yourself to learn more. You don't need a master's degree to do that. It's nice. I like that I have one uh, or a doctorate. But don't feel like you're shackled by that, like that you can't write information and that you can't be a subject matter expert and that you don't have the letters behind your name to receive or to actually deliver content. So if you want to put together content and coursework and manuals and books, let this be a moment for you. You don't have to be like, oh, I can't do it because I'm not this. Put together what you're competent at that you know there's a hole in the market that you can help support people. And you can find content, you can find peer reviewed sources through open uh, source content like PubMed that allows you to, to get the information. Now, some of the problems are without really deep understanding, you may not know how to grade the journals that are publishing them and things like that. But with that being said, uh, you may not know a lot about understanding research, and certainly I hope you don't just look at the abstract and say, ah, this is what we know. Uh, the abstracts are not what we know, and the, there is no proof of anything. Nothing proves anything. It shows correlations. So we're not out trying to prove anything. And that's why when you talk to some of the smartest people out there, some of the people who have been researching one thing their entire life and you ask them questions, a lot of times they say, I don't, I don't know. Or you know, rarely do you get an opinion. You almost always get, here's what the data says. And outside of that, we can conjecture, we can kind of piece some things together. But the truth of the matter is we don't know. So with that being said, uh, you know, I hope and those of you who are looking to, to create content to know that, that that is within your reach. The hardest part is not just the education, but it is the sitting down to do it. And Dan, that is something that you have done. You sat down, you put the reps in, you did the work. Congratulations on the project. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It was, it yeah. was, it was a great experience for me, you know, and, and, Actually, along the lines of what you were saying, find what you're passionate about. Find something that you run across every day that, that you can't find information on or, 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 or you, you want more information on. Go find that information and, 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 and put something together on that um, to start. And, and the, how much you learn and how, how much you'll feel about what you do, it just increases so much when you do something like that. 100%. 100%. Go after it, everybody. Find something you're passionate about and dig into it. With that being said, Dan, what are um, I don't, social media handles, emails, people that are interested in the, the content, the course? Like, what are ways that they can reach out to you? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm kind of a dinosaur and a troglodyte. And I don't have, I have a Facebook page, but I, I really don't use it. <laughs> um, so you can reach out to me at dan at medex, M-E-D-E-X dot fit is, is my email. Um, or you can just go to the website, medex, M-E-D-E-X dot fit uh, to, to check out the program itself. Um, and honestly, the easiest way to get a hold of me is to email me. You can find me on Facebook, Dan McKeska. I'm, I'm there. Um, so if you have something, you, know, you can reach out on Facebook. Um, I've partnered with a couple other organizations for this, uh, Functional Aging Institute, Cancer Exercise Training mm -hmm. Institute, um, uh, uh, Medical um, MedFit Association, MedFit Network. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this program's out there on a, on, through a number of different platforms as well as my own. So you, know, you can also reach out to any of these other people. That, that's how important this is to, to all of these people who are doing this, is to, is to help me get out there as well as NASM by helping me now with, by doing this podcast. 
Uh, so I do appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. Oh, man, absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you for what you've done and helping personal trainers up their game and support their client, move people towards better functional health and for their overall well-being. Uh, appreciate what you do, Dan. Thanks for everything. And thanks for everybody for listening. If you made it this far, we just over an hour, Mark. So thanks for listening. My name is Rick Ritchie. This is the NASM CPT podcast. Thank you.